So is there anyone in the audience who doesn't know what this is a picture of? Don't be bashful. Okay, you all know that it's the bridge across the bay in San Francisco, right? <laughs> Wrong. This is the Brooklyn Bridge. And for those who've never heard this before, the reason why it's the logo for this course is that the intent is based on the fact that when you have a bridge, life is never the same on either side. So if you have tremendous advances in basic biological and engineering science on one hand, mathematics, et cetera, et cetera, and then you have <clears throat> disease, patients, clinical problems, if the two worlds can't talk to one another, you have a problem. But if you can help to communicate, not by becoming a master of what the other one is doing, but of evolving common language and at the same time sharing what's known on both sides of, in this case, the East River, you have the most beautiful bridge in the world. Okay, that's the purpose of the course. Now, <laughs> Why do I always have trouble with this? Which one? Oh. And I advance it with this. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Shakespeare, and maybe many before him, had a view of the cancer problem, uh, which is as prevalent today as it's probably ever been. Uh, this is from Hamlet. Diseases desperate grown by desperate appliance are relieved, or not at all. There's no simple way to treat cancer, or for that matter, other diseases. But solid organ cancers, that is, the breast, the lungs, the liver, the brain, et cetera, et cetera, have been more resistant to any form of treatment, except one, of any of the cancers. So this is a brief history on this slide of solid tumor, solid or organ cancer therapeutics. The oldest and, in a way, most successful treatment is surgery. Uh, simply easy to said than done, it implies that one must identify the tumor at a stage when surgery can be performed. And that's one of the huge challenges in in uh, cancer research today, markers, detections, and so forth. Radiation and chemotherapy, in general, lack specificity, but have been responsible for incredible results, including cures in cancers that are not of solid organ, but are hemopoietic such as lymphomas and leukemias. However, it is rare indeed that solid organ cancers are cured by either of these modalities. And so over the past roughly two decades, plus or minus some, uh, three exciting uh, new frontiers have been introduced to the concepts of solid organ cancer therapeutics. They're part of what you might call the Renaissance challenge of our times. The first was the control of angiogenesis by the late Judah Falkman and followers. The concept that if you could control the blood supply to a tumor, you may not cure it, but it wouldn't go very far. And it could be managed, hopefully, by other means. This frontier is still very much alive. 
although it has lost a bit of preeminence with the evolution of the second and third of these on this list, uh, the second being the genomic era, the concept based upon if you understand the genomics of a given tumor, and it maybe would be very different from one individual to another, that therapeutics can be developed which are directed toward that individual's tumor. For those who want to lose sleep at night, I suggest that you read a paper published last month from Bert Vogelstein's group at Johns Hopkins, which showed that single-cell genomics of a given primary cancer in patients, solid organ cancers, show greatly different patterns of gene expression. And metastases, likewise, with regard to the primary or even one to the other. This presents enormous challenges, and yet the concept seems exciting and challenging. And the third, which is the subject of today's uh, course, is immunotherapy. Physicians will tell stories of rare patients in whom a primary cancer of a solid organ almost mysteriously disappeared. Uh, this has led scientists around the world, and it particularly led uh, Steve Rosenberg here at, at NIH to ponder the role of the host immunity with regard to cancer. And this whole concept of linkage of cancer to immunity has done many things which we'll hear about today. Of course, it's produced challenges to better understand host immunity, challenges to in some way harness it in a unique way to affect individual tumors, and it's had dramatic results in some individuals with some cancers. So today we're very fortunate to have two experts from the NCI uh, kind of discuss for us and bring us up to date as to where in their view, in their work, immunotherapy with all of its ramifications uh, stands. So our first speaker today is going to be <clears throat> Jim Gully, uh, who received his MD and PhD degree from Loma Linda University and has been at the NCI uh, since the year 2000. He is now the head of the clinical immunotherapy section of the genitourinary malignancy uh, branch of the NCI and is the director of the Medical Oncology Service in the CCR. Now, Jim has been highly recognized, widely published, and is in a unique position to discuss this important problem. Now, our second speaker is Jim Holt, who has been at the NIH for 26 years, approximately. Uh, and I had a, he's a senior investigator and heads the recombinant vaccine group of the NCI in the tumor immunology and biology branch. He received his PhD from the University of Tennessee and is an expert in the design of recombinant vaccines and vectors to deliver them, uh, the role of co-stimulation of cells in facilitating response to vaccines, and has been involved in a large number, along with Dr. Gulley, of multi-center trials in cancer centers throughout the country. So we're very grateful to both of you 
for being with us today. And I guess, Jim, you're going to speak first. I think we'll I thought, well, okay, fine, whatever you folks have worked out. Thanks. Everybody hear me uh, okay? So hi, I'm, I'm Jim Hodge. Thank you for uh, giving me the um, impetus to get out of the laboratory and actually see what's outside the room every once in a while. Um, so today I'm going to speak to you about uh, the new frontier, immunotherapy of cancer, um, combining immunotherapies. You're going to hear my perspective on, and my group's perspective on where I think I don't think we're going to talk about what the end of the road is for cancer immunotherapy. We're going to talk about maybe the next step on, on where we're going with this. I mean, actually, I built my talk to go after Dr. Gully, so let's see how good it flows this way, too. <laughs> um, before I get started, um, I'm not going to do a lot of data here, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I'm blessed to work with a, a bunch of very uh, talented people. My group is the recombinant vaccine group, Dr. Fuji, Fabian. Michelle Paget and Marion Taylor. I also work with the immunomodulation group, Dr. Sophia Gamero, cellular immunology, Dr. Kellen Yokums, and the clinical trials group, Dr. Gully, who you hear about directly after me, as well as uh, two other clinicians, Dr. Madden and Dr. Strauss. What I'll show you today is um, kind of in a case format. I'll show you some preclinical data and the ideas that drove that preclinical data. And when I can, at least in two examples, I'm going to show you the trial that came about from that preclinical data and the clinical trial results from that, so you can see how it goes translation-wise from bench to bedside. And that data is coming from the clinical trials group. Let's also mention that I have no financial relationships to disclose because I work for the government, and um, this presentation does have some unpublished data in it that's pretty much brand new. So let's start at the beginning. Um, when you think about treating cancer, why might combination therapy be needed, and what exactly is combination therapy? A little history lesson, I took this from uh, Nature Views Cancer from 2005. This is the historical perspective of chemotherapy starting at, in 1942, directly right before World War II, where they were the first successful use of a nitrogen mustard product to treat a hematopoietic tumor. So this was a single agent. This is monotherapy with, with, chemo, with a single chemotherapy agent. Fast forward 25 years, so that's that one. Fast forward 25 years, and this was the first time that they combined two chemotherapy agents together, still for the treatment of a hematopoietic tumor. And then fast forward actually 50 years until we get to where we are in 2010, where the FDA approved the most successful chemotherapy combination for advanced pancreatic patients. This is a combination of four chemotherapy agents, um, flinic acid, A5-FU, aronitinkan, and oxaliplatin. And the reason I bring this up is, historically, you can think about immunotherapy the same way that we looked at chemotherapy. With, with chemotherapy, we saw monotherapy activity early on. There was some activity in select tumor types. Again, not really solid tumors. Um, but once we advanced to combining chemotherapies, we saw improved overall response plate, durability of response, and increased overall survival. So our question is, are we already seeing the same thing and the same trends with immunotherapy? And the answer is, I think, yes. We have seen some activity as uh, immunotherapy Single agents in select tumor types, uh, an example of this would be ipilimumab or CTLA-4 in melanoma, which is used as a single agent, or perhaps other checkpoints, which you'll hear from, from Dr. Gully. But following along on this, this thought, we all have, we have limited data with combining immuno-oncology agents. However, what, what data we do have suggests that we are seeing the same thing as with chemotherapy that's improved overall response plate and durability response and, and even improved overall survival. The rub is, how do we rationally choose immuno-oncology agents to combine with each other? If you looked at the menu of available options from all the biotech companies and all the research labs in the country, it is an enormous undertaking. We have to find a way to rationally choose the agents that we combine to attack the problems that we want. And so kind of getting there, I think the next step on this road, not the end of the road, but 
is combining standard of care agents, including radiation, certain chemotherapies, maybe small molecule inhibitors. These are things the FDA has already approved. Let's combine those with immuno-oncology agents to address specific problems as we work on how to combine multiple immuno-oncology agents further on down the road. And this is what I'll be focusing my talk on today. So we talk about standard of care therapy, such as radiation and chemotherapy, and how to combine with immunotherapy, we have to start with a hypothesis. The hypothesis, at least for some immunotherapies, that when a cancer patient walks into the door of the doctor's office, they already have T cells that are specific for their tumors. Their T cells just aren't very in high numbers, perhaps, or they don't have a lot of activity, so they're not efficient enough to control this tumor's growth. But if we start with that hypothesis, that means we can take those pre-existing T cells and we can make them better with immuno-oncology agents, such as anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1, certain cytokines, or other things, including vaccines. The second part of this hypothesis is that standard of care therapy alone can induce T cells specific for certain kind of tumors, and then we can take those T cells and make them better with the same agents, uh, immuno-oncology agents that we have listed at the bottom of the screen as an example. So the first question is, can radiation or chemotherapy alone induce immune responses? And the answer, and the way this would happen is this is a tumor getting radiation or chemotherapy. Some cells will die, and those cells will go to the draining lymph node, perhaps tra uh, trafficked by dendritic cells. At the draining lymph node, you will prime T cells specific for some of these antigens on these dying cells. These T cells will go back and attack the tumor, and this will cycle over and over again. Now, does this happen or not? So this is called immunogenic cell death in the literature. And these three re key review articles on radiation and this very good review article from Lorenzo Gazzulli, the cancer cell, put together looks at 20 different uh, clinical trials examining two different types of radiation and seven different types of chemotherapy. And the, and the answer is the same for all of these review articles. Uh, in killing tumor cells by uh, chemotherapy or radiation is really not sufficient to induce a very active T cell response. There are measurable T cells but they are uh, weak in numbers and weak in efficiency. We see this as an opportunity because we can take these T cells and we can increase their function, perhaps by adding something else that we can talk about later. <clears throat> so there might be a potential to augment this activity with active immunotherapy. You're going to hear uh, in some of the case studies today, we're going to talk about one of the ways we can augment this anti-tumor activity is with a vaccine. Uh, you'll hear from Dr. Gully and that we've uh, been able to have lots of patients treated with a, a pox virus-based vaccine. These vaccines encode tumor antigens, uh, for, such as prostate-specific antigen for prostate, CA and MUC1, where we use um, in multiple tumor types. And this is an antigen called brachyuri, which is responsible for what makes a tumor leave the primary site and become a metastasis. So we can put these tumor antigens in pox virus vectors, uh, yeast vectors, or adenovirus vectors, but they all function the same way. They present the antigen to the immune system in a certain format, the immune system then recognizes that that antigen um, needs to have T cells derived against it, and then you start an immune response against that antigen. And you'll hear more about these from later on in my talk and also from Dr. Gully's talk. So we focus on two areas when we think about how to combine standard of care with uh, emerging ex uh, oncology reagents. The first is what we'll focus on today. We call it immunogenic modulation. What this is is treating a tumor with an agent and that tumor will change its phenotype to become more sensitive to immune-mediated killing. The second thing we focus on is immune conditioning, which is using these same agents, but now we're going to modulate the immune cell subsets in the periphery to enable a more productive immune interaction. So perhaps using chemotherapy to downregulate regulatory T cells so you get better active uh, T cells that you want. Um, but we're going to focus on immunogenic modulation today. So why study immunogenic modulation in the context of immunotherapy? Well, the optimal use of immunotherapy, I don't think anybody will disagree, may actually be in combination with standard of care or emerging experimental therapeutics. By understanding this process of immunogenic modulation, it might allow us to use immunotherapy earlier in the disease process rather than wait till after a patient has already failed standard of care radiation or chemotherapy. Certain modalities may act synergistically with immunotherapy, perhaps by enhancing immune responses, inhibiting immune suppressive functions, or altering the phenotype of tumor cells to render them more sensitive to immune-mediated killing. And finally, radiation, chemotherapy, small molecule inhibitors, or other biologics could actually serve as a boost uh, to immunotherapy, in, in other words, serving as a vaccine unto itself. This cartoon encapsulates everything I'd like to communicate with you today. You take a tumor, you attack it with radiation, chemotherapy, endocrine deprivation, small molecules, and that tumor has a choice. It can either live or it dies. 
And if it dies, it can die in a way that it just goes away, or it can die where it induces a very weak immune response. That's what we said earlier when we talked about immunogenic modulation. We're not worried about either of these two processes. What we're worried about is what happens when you attack a tumor and it doesn't die. But what we found is when this cell doesn't die, it still knows it's been attacked. And in response to this attack, it changes, it changes its surface phenotype. It upregulates MHC class one. It upregulates ICAM, death receptors, FAS, and TRAIL. And it does other things. And in this change, this tumor becomes more attractive and more killable to the immune system. That would be T cells and natural killer cells. Uh, one word about dose. Um, there are several people that uh, look at radiation as a way to make this cell more attractive to immunotherapy. And there's a debate about do you use a little radiation or do you use high dose radiation? Um, and what we've kind of um, settled on is you can, you can do anything you want experimentally in the lab, but you have to get physicians to embrace that concept. And right now they embrace standard of care. So if you're, gonna, if you're a physician treating prostate cancer, you're going to get fractionated radiation up to 70 gray. We're saying do that. Pick your radiation dose, your curative intent dose, but do it with immunotherapy so what dies, dies, and what lives is more killable by the immunotherapy. So I brought three examples to share with you today. The first is combining uh, immuno-oncology agents with external beam radiation. I'll briefly talk about our, our experience combining these agents with chemotherapy, uh, particular, particularly taxane, and then I'll finally talk about where we're going next, which is combining multiple immuno-oncology agents also with vaccine. So first, external beam radiation. When radiation oncologists talk about killing a tumor cell with radiation, they're usually focused at the high dose range, which directly kills the tumor to generation of reactive oxygen species. What we found is that lower doses of radiation, perhaps what you might see earlier in the fractionation process, um, we get other changes that are good for the immune system. At lower doses of radiation, we get um, changes in tumor vasculature. We get normalization of tumor vasculature. At higher doses, you get upregulation of MHC class one, ICAM one, FAS and trail. And at higher doses, or perhaps at the end of your fractionation, you get direct tumor cell lysis, which can feed dendritic cells, go to the draining lymph node, and prime new T cell responses. So this entire spectrum of radiation could be helpful to engaging the immune response. The bottom line of all this is that treatment of tumor cells with sublethal doses of radiation changes that tumor's phenotype and makes them more sensitive to immune-mediated killing. Let me show an example of that. So this is a, a mouse model. We have a CEA transgenic mouse. This is a mouse that expresses carcinoembryonic antigen, which is a colorectal tumor antigen, um, in its germline. So this mouse looks just like an advanced colorectal carcinoma patient. It expresses CEA in its serum. It's very difficult to mount an immune response to CEA in this mouse. So we're going to vaccinate this mouse with one of these vaccines that I talked about earlier. This is a, a vaccine that contains the antigen CEA, but also three T cell costimulatory molecules. In this model, we're going to withhold the vaccine until day eight. If we give the vaccine on day four, we can cure these tumors. If you withhold the vaccine till day eight, it fails. So we made it fail on purpose here. We're gonna give radiation on day 14, either eight gray or two gray a day for four days, it's the same. Then we boost with a, a booster vaccine that also has CEA in it on days 15, 22, and 29. Now what happens? So each of these black lines is the tumor growth of a, of a single mouse. So there's 12 mice on this graph. Without treatment, these tumors grow quite rapidly, as you can see. The vaccine alone, when withheld till day eight, quite rapid tumor growth. The radiation alone has no effect on this tumor growth at all. But look at this. This is mice that got vaccinated first. And what happens is T cells get induced against the tumor. They amass at the borders of the tumor, but they're just not effective enough to control the tumor. Then we irradiate the tumor. The tumor changes its phenotype, and it really enables the T cells function at the tumor site, and then everything starts to work. In fact, we cured five out of nine of these mice, and these are almost 200 millimeter tumors that actually shrunk away over the course of seven days. It's, uh, it's quite striking. Now, if you look at day 21 while these tumors are going away, um, you can see that this is CD8 uh, infiltration of the tumor. So kind of a cool tumor. Um, I mean, not very well T cell infiltrated with no treatment. Vaccine alone and radiation alone really doesn't change that. But if you first vaccinate and then irradiate, you get a profound infiltration of CD3 cells. By flow cytometry, the majority of these were CD8 cells. And here's where we made our very interesting observation. This was a CEA transgenic mouse. We vaccinated it with a CEA vaccine. It had a CEA positive tumor. The tumor's going away filled with T cells. So what do you think the T cells were specific for? And of course, we would say CEA. It turns out not to be the case. 90% of the cells that are inside this tumor are specific for a completely different tumor antigen. 
that was also present in the tumor. This one's called GP70. So what we did is we induced an immune response. Some of the T cell, some of the tumors were killed, and then the tumor really picked its own tumor antigen to propagate this T cell response. And I'll show you a couple more examples of this. So this tumor antigen is called GP70. If you look at the immune responses in these mice at the CD4 level, you see we induced responses to CEA because that's what we vaccinated for, but also to a second tumor antigen, P53, which you may have heard of. And at the CD8 level, we induced T cell responses to CEA, P53, and this is the GP70 that we just saw. But what's interesting is the magnitude of the immune response to the GP70, which was the secondary antigen, was 15 times greater than what we actually vaccinated for, the CEA. We call this antigen cascade, which you'll hear more about later. Um, it's also called cryptic determinants, epitope spreading, or determinant spreading. And what this is is um, an immunological response demonstrating epitopes distinct from and non-cross-reactive with the inducing epitope. And this can include neoepitopes, which you may hear about in the literature. So you, you don't even know, we measured two antigens from that mouse, but we didn't measure the 500 antigens that we didn't know that existed due to neoepitopes. But you're going to get all of that from this kind of an antigen cascade response. Antigen cascade could be a possible mechanism for the regression of antigen variant tumors, tumors at distal sites, or micrometastatic deposits. I'm going to show you some clinical um, examples of this. This is from one, a trial that Dr. Gully ran. These are patients getting an early version of our, our PSA vaccine for prostate cancer. Um, they were getting their prime and their boost just like uh, regular, but in the middle of this immunization regimen, the patients got standard radiation therapy for their prostate cancer. Then we measured their T cell responses to PSA and other antigens after they were done with the trial. And what they found was, and these are six patients, but let's just focus on this first patient. This is T, T, um, precursor frequency of T cells. So this patient looking at PSA, they had no detectable T cells. It was below our detection limit, specific for PSA before they started the therapy. And after the therapy, the frequency was 1 in 85,000, which is a pretty good increase in T cells. But also, we saw brand new responses to other prostate antigens, such as prostatic acid phosphatase, PSCA, another antigen, MUC1. So we saw this epitope spreading or antigen cascade in a patient. And also, you might notice that the magnitude of the immune response to this antigen that we didn't vaccinate for is four times greater than the one that we did vaccinate for. So this is exactly the same thing we saw in the mouse. And what we're starting to think is that it might be the breadth of this antigen cascade that's really responsible for controlling tumor. And we saw this in in these six patients. So what about human uh, tumors and how they respond to, to radiation? I showed you some mouse data. This is three human tissue culture lines, one lung, one breast, and one prostate. We exposed these to um, radiation, either zero gray or 10 gray of radiation. This dose of radiation doesn't stop these cells. They still proliferate after this dose of radiation. They're, they're fine. But we saw how they were killed by T cells specific for two tumor antigens that are on these, either CEA or MUC1 after they've been exposed to radiation. So this is how this lung tumor line was killed by a CEA-specific T cell without radiation, and this is how it was killed after it was exposed to radiation. So we've enhanced the recognition and, and killability, I guess, of this tumor by exposing it to radiation, not just for lung, but we saw the same thing for breast and prostate. It didn't improve the killing just for CEA-specific T cells. It also improved the killing for other T cells that were specific for a second antigen in this tumor called MUC1. So, again, three out of three lines here. The mechanism of this was modulation of antigen processing machinery. In other words, we get more of the right peptide presented in the, the major histocompatibility complex. And it was also associated with the upregulation of a molecule called calreticulin, which is normally in the cell cytoplasm. Um, and after the cell is exposed to radiation and some chemotherapies and other stressing agents, this molecule will translocate to the cell surface. And this is associated with better recognition and killing of the, of the tumor cell by immune cells. This is uh, an example of that. This is a prostate tumor cell line grown in a nude mouse. This is how it expresses calreticulin. Um, three days after it's exposed to a 10 gray dose of radiation, you can see there's a lot more calreticulin. But more importantly, if you look at the cell membrane, it's all translocated to the cell membrane in this signet ring staining pattern. And we found that this is associated with increased sensitivity to T cell and NK killing. It's also heartening that late last year, a paper came out in blood that saw that calreticulin exposure in malignant blast could also correlate with robust anti-cancer immunity and patients have AML. So we may be on the right track here with calreticulin. So here's a translation story. Um, there is a drug called Samarium 153. It's used to treat men with um, prostate cancer that's metastasized to the bone. This is often a very painful 
uh, place to have a bone metastasis. This drug is called Quadramet. It is a therapeutic agent consisting of a radioactive samarium and a tetraphosphate chelator. This drug looks like calcium. And it's taken up by osteoblastic bone lesions, uh, usually in the spine or ribs of men with uh, metastatic prostate cancer. So this dose of radiation that's delivered through this radionuclide is not enough to make the tumor go away, um, but it is enough to make the, the pain go less. That's why it's approved for palliation of bone met pain. Um, but what we noticed was that the dose of calculated radiation, perhaps to each met, fell right in our sweet spot of the dose of radiation that might change the, the phenotype of these tumors, similar to what we saw with gamma radiation or other studies we did with yttrium-90. <clears throat> So we asked the question, do palliative levels of samarium-153 modulate metastatic human tumor phenotype? So we took our prostate tumor cell line, LNCAP, exposed it to 0 to 50 gray of samarium-153, and then looked at its phenotype and sensitivity to T-cell killing three days later. So this is that cell. We saw almost a three-fold upregulation of MHC class 1, which is associated with better immune recognition. We saw an a significant increase in the death receptor FAS. Not only that, but by RT-PCR, we saw that after radiation, these cells expressed more important tumor antigens that might contribute to cascade, such as a th almost a three-fold increase in PSA, a 30-fold increase in prostatic acid phosphatase, 10-fold increase in CEA. These are antigens that could participate later, perhaps in immune uh, cascade. How are these cells killed? This is a PSA-specific T cell. This is how these cells are killed without radiation. They're hardly killed at all. After they've been exposed to 25 gray or exposed to 50 gray of radiation, we're approaching 100% uh, killability of these cells. We saw the same thing with a muc one specific cytotoxic T cell. So we used this data to design, and Dr. Gully conducted a phase two clinical trial at the clinical center across the street. This was a two-arm study where patients with metastatic um, prostate cancer to the bone received a palliative dose of samarium-153. We intended to accrue 34 patients, and the other arm simply got PROSVAC, that's our PSA vaccine that you'll hear about more later. Then they were followed that with the palliative dose of samarium-153. Here's that the results from that trial. This is um, the samarium-153 alone trial. This is the palliative dose. Increases the time to progression in these patients by 1.7 months. That's about in line with what this drug did. But if you simply vaccinate first for PSA and then give the palliative dose of samarium-153, we can push the time to progression from 1.7 months to 3.7 months. And that's a win. It seems like a small amount, but it's, it's a win in this patient population. It was statistically significant, P equals 003, um, excuse me, 03. And now we're using this data to draw, uh, plan a new uh, phase two trial where we're combining our PSA vaccine prospect with an alpha emitter, radium-223. So finishing up on radiation very quickly, we've been able to do um, multiple studies with external beam radiation, both proton and photon, radiofrequency ablation, Brachytherapy, we published papers on radionuclide chelates, both radium-223 and samarium-153, and radiolabeled monoclonal antibodies. And it turns out that um, pretty much all these different forms of radiation all function very similarly in their way that they can change tumor phenotype. We've been able to translate two of these into clinical trials. I showed you the, one of the earlier trials combining external beam radiation and vaccine, and I showed you the um, samarium-153 trial where we combine that with vaccine, and we're moving forward in this, in this area. The second short example I'll share with you today is our experience with combining um, immunotherapy, with chemo, uh, immunotherapy with chemotherapy, particularly <clears throat> taxanes. For this, we focused on docetaxel. Docetaxel is the most prescribed chemotherapy in the United States. Um, I can tell you that exposing tumor cells to docetaxel, they change their phenotype, and they're killed better by T cells and NK cells. Is an example of that. This is a prostate tumor cell line, LNCAP. This is how they're killed without any exposure to docetaxel. This is how well they're killed after exposure to 25 or 250 nanograms per mil of docetaxel. These are both clinical doses of docetaxel. So they're killed better after they've been exposed to docetaxel. Although they don't, you know, treat them with chemo at this dose, these cells don't even look like they've been hit. They just proliferate fine, they, they divide fine, no problems. But something's changed that makes them more recognizable and more killable. This improved uh, sensitivity to killing was associated with the translocation of calreticulin. This is a nude mouse xenograft from our prostate tumors. This is just the one that was treated with docetaxel. You can see there's nice calreticulin, and more importantly, it's translocated to the cell surface. 
Um, we were able to use siRNA knockdown to, to show the importance of coreticulin. This is our prostate tumor cell and how it's killed before and after exposure to docetaxel. Very nice improvement. If you knock down calreticulin or knock down the molecule responsible for calreticulin's translocation to the cell surface, we ruin this improvement, as you can see here. But more importantly, chemotherapy resistant cells treated with docetaxel still undergo immunogenic modulation. I'll show you what I mean. So, this is a, another cell line, SW620. And we took the cell line and we grew it in small concentrations of docetaxel. And every week when we split the cells, we increased the concentration of docetaxel. We did this for a year. So finally, we developed a cell line that was completely resistant to docetaxel. This is the one we started with, the parental cell line. This is how it grows without docetaxel. This is how it grows with docetaxel. So it, this is a non-cytolytic dose. Um, these cells proliferate slower, but they're still alive and they're still dividing, but they're just slower, but nothing like without docetaxel. Now, this is the resistant one that took us a year to make. This is how it grows in the presence and absence of docetaxel. It's completely impervious. However, it's not impervious to the immunogenic modulation activity of the chemotherapy. This is calreticulin translocation of the parental. We, we were able to translocate calreticulin after exposure to docetaxel. And the docetaxel-resistant one still moved calreticulin to the cell surface, exactly like the parental cell line. More importantly, how are these cells killed? This is a CEA-specific T cell. This is how the parental line, this one, is killed before and after exposure <clears throat> to docetaxel. Here's the resistant line. This is how it's killed before and after exposure to docetaxel. So even though these cells are resistant to the classical effects of docetaxel, they're not resistant to the immunogenic modulation properties of docetaxel. This data was the foundation for a phase two clinical trial where we combined another vaccine called PANVAC. That's a vaccine that can encode CEA and MUC1, two tumor antigens. And we use this in um, women with breast cancer and we combine this with docetaxel. So this was uh, the data that came from that trial. The patients that were just given docetaxel alone, this is standard of care docetaxel, had a time to progression of 3.9 months. And if you were able to vaccinate and give docetaxel in this patient population, we could push that time to progression out to 7.9 months. Okay, so not to give you a laundry list, but we've seen this immunogenic modulation with lots of standard of cares. This is really a list of options. We've seen it with many taxanes, including docetaxel, paclitaxel, NAB paclitaxel, we've seen it with chemotherapy, cisplatin 5-FU or cisplatin and venerylbean. Every form of radiation you can think of, e external beam, proton, photon, brachiary, excuse me, brachytherapy, chelate or radiofrequency, certain PARP inhibitors, select TKI, such as sunitinib, serafinib, or carbazantinib. Um, HDAC inhibition can also modulate tumor phenotypes, such as varinostat or antinostat, and also endocrine deprivation agents, such as enzalutamide, or abiraterone, tamoxifen, or aromatase inhibitors can also stress the tumor out in a way that makes it more recognizable by T cells. Now I'd like to finally finish up on where we're going with multiple immuno-oncology combinations. So now we have a new hypothesis. Our hypothesis is that effective therapy of established tumors requires multiple agents that are selected for a certain reason to target diverse immune tumor interactions. And the way we like to look at this is to get an effective anti-tumor response, you really need to target three areas. The first is engage, which is the induction. You need to induce antigen-specific T cells. You can't rely on what the patient walked in the door with. The second is expand, which is you have to take those T cells you just made and expand them in their activity and their function. And their third is enable. You have to make sure that those T cells, once they get to the tumor microenvironment, they still retain their function. That means you have to support their metabolic needs, support their oxygen needs, and, and other things to make sure that you make T cells in high numbers of high quality that retain their function in the tumor microenvironment. So how do we do this? We can engage with cancer vaccines, which we've talked about today, CAR T cells, perhaps chemo can induce T cells. We can expand them with cytokines or chemokines, such as IL-2, like Dr. Rosenberg does, or perhaps others, or co-stimulatory molecules or TLRs. And we can enable their function in the tumor microenvironment, perhaps by uh, an agent that can support certain metabolic activity, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So can one treat established tumors with multiple agents targeting diverse tumor interactions? For my case today, I present the combination of five agents. Uh, the first is a vaccine, um, and the second is a cytokine, IL-15. This is a, an IL-15 IL uh, receptor super agonist. We're going to use an anti-gitter antibody. We're going to use an anti-ox-40 antibody, and we're going to use an IDO inhibitor, which we'll talk about more in just a second. So, the way we're able to pull this off is by having collaborative research and development agreements with three different companies, Etubix, Ultra Bioscience, and Insight. 
And we pre-agree with these companies that if we're successful, um, they will let us do a trial combining their agents. So we, we don't start any studies until we have a translational path that we know we're going to be able to go to the clinic. So what do we expect to get out of these? We expect to induce T cells with our vaccine. We expect to expand those T cells and increase their activity with the interleukin-15 or IL-15. We're going to increase the number and activity. These are two um, agonist antibodies. The, the getter um, is found on Treg. So if we're going to give this uh, antibody, we expect to reduce regulatory T cell function. If we're going to give the OX40, we're going to increase CD8 T cell function. So we're, again, we're engaging and expanding. Both of these also have um, regulatory Treg inhibition functions. And this is uh, an inhibitor of, uh, of IDO, in, which I can't pronounce, but it's IDO. And what this is is in the tumor, the tumor can catabolize tryptophan, breaks it down into a, um, a byproduct called kinurin. And kinurin is very suppressive to T cells. So if you can inhibit this enzyme, it maintains tryptophan in the tumor microenvironment and maintains uh, activity of cells, NK cells and T cells in the environment. So we wanted to mix all five of these things together. Perhaps mix is the wrong word. We strategically selected them and put them together in the right order. So I'm going to give you a very brief overview of what happened. <clears throat> this is our CEA transgenic mouse model that we discussed earlier. Um, we give, we start therapy on, on day seven with our vaccine. Um, we start, we get, put the IDO inhibitor in the mouse's food starting at day seven. And we give these agonist antibodies down the road. We tested all 16 combination iterations. Every group of mice had 15 in it. Here's our two favorite groups. These are mice without any treatment. These are mice that got all five treatments. So then again, we had a pretty striking anti-tumor activity. We cured one out of 15 mice here. But what happened to all the other combinations? So here they are. Um, this is the single agent combinations. This is OX40 alone. This is Gitter alone. This is IDO alone. So really no monotherapy activity. This is our, our dual agents. This is perhaps OX40 and IDO or vaccine and, and IDO. You can see that really nothing is working when you have single agent activity. Think about to our chemotherapy example. Nothing is really working when you combine two agents when you combine three agents here, it's really when you combine all five agents together that everything starts to work. I'm going to show you this data one more way. It's the same data you just looked at. Um, but this, we use a stoplight key to kind of keep track of this. This is mice treated with nothing. This is mice treated with our five agents, which we call pentatherapy. Now, if you remove a single one of these, and you can see what its effect is on the therapy. So if you remove perhaps the vaccine in the IL-15, that would be this top light, you ruin the entire anti-tumor effect, which you can see here. If you give all five agents but hold back either the Gitter or the OX40, you have a complete loss of anti-tumor activity. If you have all the agents together but just hold back the IDO inhibitor from the mouse's food, you lose all the anti-tumor activity. You need all five agents, and all five agents have a statistical role in maintaining this um, tumor suppression. So I, this is almost my last slide. Um, so what we've been able to do is put together all of our experiments in, to say, percent tumor control over many different immuno-oncology combinations. It's any mouse at the end of the experiment with a smaller size tumor. And what you can see here is mice treated with no therapy have no tumor control. One agent, two agent, three agents, four agents, and then when you have five agents, you have very good tumor control. What's scary about this graph, though, perhaps, is it's not linear. This combination of four agents is worse than this one agent here. This combination of two agents is completely non-effective and worse than one or almost none here. So it's, it's not linear and it's non-intuitive. So we have to select agents to target a specific pathway that we want to hit to engage all things to get this to work or engage, expand, and enable. So this is my last slide. So we can engage perhaps by using a vaccine, maybe vaccines targeting neoantigens, we can also engage with using an IDO inhibitor to support the metabolic environment. We can expand these with the cytokine or checkpoints, which you'll hear about from Dr. Gully, um, or other uh, agonist antibodies. And we can enable the immune response in the microenvironment, perhaps by inducing uh, immunogenic modulation, which we spent most of our time today discussing, or other cytokines to increase their function in the tumor microenvironment. And perhaps Dr. Gully will tell us where we're going with all this by talking about a new adaptive clinical trial design where we're gonna engage all three of these arms of the immune system in a new clinical trial uh, design. With that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, if you wish to ask questions, uh, we will pass the microphone. There are many people uh, uh, online and elsewhere, and so they'd like to hear the questions rather than just the answers. Yeah.
Thank you. It was very exciting to hear all this news. Um, uh, once I heard uh, uh, there were a couple observations of like radiation therapy. I, I was interested in X-ray in the past, um, and the X-rays we're using for you know radiation therapy, and uh, the, some uh, metastasis uh, on like one side of the body was irradiated, and then the tumors sort of melted away everywhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, so is that one of the examples of immune function activation? That what we would call an excellent example of anagen cascade. So you induce, you irradiate a tumor, you induce T cells that can then travel all over, recognize tumors that are outside the radiation field, um, perhaps to the same antigen you induced immune response to, but perhaps to other antigens, including neoepitope antigens. So it's the only way that could really happen. It's immune mediated, of course, but we think that's a really good example of antigen cascade. I couldn't agree more. And another short question. What, uh, say, what tools um, uh, you think may be helpful for you to track what happens with the immune system and what with all these uh, immune system cells once they are activated and they start surrounding the tumor? Wow, that's, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, so you've kind of hit on... I would say a major limitation of, of what we do. We, you've seen some empirical evidence of anti-tumor activity in mice, and we see some, we're gonna see some activity in, in humans. And the big black box is how did the tumor go away in the first place? What cells were there? How many of them were there? What their location was to the vasculature in the tumor? What their location was to the edge of the tumor? Um, you know, the tumor microenvironment is the mystery, and that is, where we're really focusing our efforts on moving forward now, and I think it's only going to make our, our therapeutic choices more logical and perhaps better. But you've identified a very key problem. Uh, Jim, maybe I could ask, what is the current status <clears throat> regarding uh, the approval and performance <clears throat> of clinical studies in human patients, particularly regarding this concept that... Uh, as many as 10 agents at the same time yep. being administered mm -hmm. in combination with uh, radiation and immunotherapy. Where, where do things stand in that? that? Okay, that's a very good question. And <clears throat> what I can tell you is, um, historically, we always thought we were moving toward more combination is perhaps better. I, I will tell you that there was, um, in a single day at the FDA, um, I think it was not too many months ago, they approved a clinical trial in pancreatic cancer combining 12 agents. Um, and I've never seen a trial like that approved. And then on the same day, they approved nine other trials. There was a breast tumor trial, there was a pancreatic trial, there's a brain trial, there's a prostate trial, and it's all combining 10 or more agents. This is all done by the same company. Um, and they've already treated some patients with this multi-agent combination. That's a very aggressive way to go. And, and the FDA's approving that kind of a protocol signals their, their buy-in to, I think, this concept. We're, Dr. Gully is going to describe a more kind of measured approach, uh, which is its adaptive trial design, because you know, there's got to be a scientific rationale and a safety signal to get up to that number. I think we're all going the same direction. We're just going at different speeds. And I think I'll let Dr. Gully handle the rest of that question. Doesn't it seem a little bit amazing? Uh, I'm not questioning what the FDA does, but we hear so much uh, reticence uh, and require to approve drugs and the requirement for extensive studies in cells and animals and all sorts of things. And yet, what does it mean when they improve as many as 10 different things all being given to the same patient? How do you... How do you write a proposal for such a thing? <laughs> Go ahead, James. You can handle this one. <laughs> so, I will come All right. Keep going. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a that's a great question and a great lead into um, yes. the talk here. Um, I think what what um, oh, perfect. I think there's a difference. Also, we, we should 
remember, between getting something FDA approved and approval to do the clinical trial. If you do a clinical trial and you combine 12 different agents, how to understand which of those agents are necessary and sufficient to cause the, the effect, that becomes your real scientific question. And that's going to be really difficult to tease out, tease out. But I think if you can make any progress in pancreatic cancer, that would be very nice. So I'm simply delighted to be here today to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in a, an example of a, a tumor that really is not responsive to immunotherapy. So uh, a tumor that really is a what we call a T-cell poor tumor, a tumor that's not recognized by the immune system. So I kind of liken that to the, the, the uh, cold tundra. So here you have two pictures, right? You have this barren, cold tundra on the left here, which really isn't that inviting, especially this time of year. You, you don't really want to go be there. You'd rather be here in this uh, nice tropical island, right, uh, that's teeming with life. And uh, if you think about it from a tumor standpoint, you have these tumors that have absolutely no or very limited T cells, and, and you saw a picture of that um, that Dr. Hodge showed. But then you also have tumors that, that the immune system recognizes, and there's just uh, full of T cells. And that's really where we want to go. So we want to be able to find ways where we can take these tumors that the immune system doesn't recognize and make them recognizable, as Dr. Hodge mentioned. So we really think that the key concept here is in order to get effective immunotherapy, you first have to be able to have an immune system that recognizes the tumor, recognizes there's something wrong, and then you have to be able to expand, as Dr. Hodge mentioned, but also once those T cells get to the uh, tumor, you have to allow them to be effective within the tumor microenvironment. So we're gonna be hitting on this, um, um, this dual role for effective immunotherapy, um, dual requirements, rather, for effective immunotherapy throughout this talk. So if you have a, a, a immune system that recognizes your tumor, what we've seen is many examples of tumors that you can simply give PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors, and we're going to talk a little bit about that and a little about what exactly those are. What you can see is those tumors uh, actually melting away nicely. So what you can see here, these are examples of what's called a spider plot. And at the beginning, you have the, the, the volume or, or the measurement of the tumor uh, by a CAT scan uh, at baseline. And what you can see in this example here is that this patient had a nice decrease in the tumor volume. And you see all these lines going down, that, that indicates tumor shrinking and going away. The lines going up indicate tumors getting bigger. But what you can see is that with these PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, you can see a large proportion of the patients having deep and durable responses that are often very rapid in a matter of weeks after starting the therapy, and often associated with very little in terms of, of side effects. But it's typically not seen in, in T-cell poor tumors like prostate cancer. You don't see this activity with these types of new immune therapies. These new immune therapies have, have uh, shown substantial activity over the last uh, five years and have led to multiple FDA approvals um, in multiple different uh, disease indications. So you could, as you can see here, this was a recent review late last year showing the objective response rates to multiple different cancers. So you can see melanoma here, um, Merkel cell carcinoma, very high response rates, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, but here you have prostate cancer, very low response rates, and this may be related to the relatively low uh, amount of uh, mutations uh, and therefore chances that the immune system can see something as being abnormal. I'll let you take the picture there. All right, perfect. Um, and so what this has led people to look at is look at the tumor mutation burden across multiple different tumors. And what you can see is that those tumors that have the higher tumor mutation burden, um, they have a higher likelihood of having these neoantigens, these, these um, targets that look foreign to the immune system. And indeed, what you can see is that a lot of these tumors 
have um, been approved for these anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1 agents. These were the first ones that, that were approved. But it's really not necessarily tumor specific, but it's more mutation specific. So there was a recent approval last year with pembrolizumab, one of the anti-PD-L1 anti-PD-1 antibodies, for any cancer that was MSI high. So microsatellite instability, very many mutations, and that's basically would be mutations um, that are very high, as indicated in this red box here. And so even patients um, that have prostate cancer could have uh, microsatellite instability. So indeed, this uh, led to FDA approval, as I mentioned, of pembrolizumab, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, including patients with prostate cancer. So you might ask, well, how common is it for patients to have microsatellite instability with prostate cancer? It turns out it's not that common. Um, if you have localized disease, it's estimated about 2%, probably a little bit higher for patients with metastatic disease. In general, probably it's going to be around 5 to 6% uh, based on recent data. And so this really suggests that one uh, should look at these patients with metastatic disease, though, and, and evaluate them for this uh, marker that could signal a, an effective therapy in addition to the other therapies that we have for patients with prostate cancer. But I would argue that right now we've seen a, a, a lot of single agent activity, but we're starting to run out of targets for single agent activity. We're getting all those tumors that are, are T cell high, but now we need to start focusing on the majority of tumors that really are not T cell high. And so, What's left? Well, you have these, these T cell high tumors, the melanoma, the lung cancer, the bladder cancer, and a few other cancers, Hodgkin's, et cetera, that you have good immune recognition, good clinical response to immune checkpoint inhibition. However, there are a number of uh, uh, situations where you don't have good um, clinical response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And these are either cancers that have previously uh, um, progressed on um, immune checkpoint inhibitors are either primary refractory, uh, progressed growing right through it, or acquired resistance, they initially progressed, or sorry, initially responded, but then progressed, or patients that have T cell poor tumors that never had the immune system recognize the tumor, um, such as prostate cancer. And I, I happen to be a prostate cancer doc, so I, I'm, I'm focusing on that uh, for our talk today. But I really think that this next frontier, looking at these T cell poor tumors, is going to require combination approaches, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Hodge. Um, and so, if you have a T cell inflamed tumor, such as melanoma, small cell lung cancer, bladder cancer, if you give an anti PD1 or anti PDL1 agent, you can see the tumor shrinking away. However, if you don't have this uh, T cell inflamed tumor, if you give the anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL-1 tumor, it's kind of like pouring gasoline on dirt. You don't see any, um, any fire there. Whereas if you can generate that immune recognition of the tumor and then you add in the PD-1 or PDL-1 inhibitor, you can allow those immune cells to be effective within the tumor microenvironment, and we'll talk about that briefly, then you can see uh, this uh, immune system actually taking care of the tumor. So Dr. Hodge kind of talked about this a little bit, and this was actually from our initial trial of radiation plus uh, vaccine th uh, therapy. And what we wanted to look at was what is the most efficient way to generate a T cell recognition of the uh, tumor? So you can get some immunogenic cell death with radiation or with other therapies. And, and so what we wanted to do is look at how effective are different therapies. So, we took patients that were cancer-free, men, uh, older men, and, and you can see here there was no immune response whether you look, and this was based on antibody responses to either cell lines, uh, cell line lysates by Western blot, or an antigen array of, of prostate cancer proteins. And then we took men that were diagnosed with prostate cancer but had um, no treatment for their prostate cancer who were undergoing active surveillance, and you can see a low level of response. Radiation alone, a low level of response. If you added in hormonal therapy, androgen deprivation therapy, you can see that was an increased level of response, about 20%. But it wasn't until you added in the vaccine that you got 50% of the men now 
uh, being able to mount an immune response that was um, recognizable against the, the tumor. So what are different ways of generating uh, um, immune cells, T cells that can recognize the tumor? Well, I, th I think there's, in general, there's two different ways. One is using a vaccine approach. Uh, vaccines, we all kind of think of when we think of vaccines, we think of the infectious disease-based vaccines like the flu shot, uh, which many of us get every year. Um, and this is really something that is very similar in cancer. What we're trying to do here is give a target to the immune system, allow the immune system to recognize a target, and then go throughout the body and, and find those cells making the, that target. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about, more about therapeutic vaccines. The other way of doing this is taking T cells out of the body and manipulating those T cells uh, specifically outside of the body. Um, for instance, with adoptive cellular therapy, maybe you can change the T cell uh, and, and have the T cell specific for a given target, or you can adapt the T cell to have an antibody on it instead of the T cell receptor. And, um, and that could recognize the, the target of interest and kill the cell that way. And those are called CAR T cells. And recently there were uh, several CAR T cells that were approved for uh, relapse in refractory acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So what's really sufficient to generate an immune response? Well, if you have a T cell poor tumor with these immune checkpoint inhibitors alone, you really aren't gonna have anything that works as we talked about before. So I just wanted to throw this up as an example. We're gonna gray that out now. And we're gonna talk about vaccine versus adoptive cellular therapy. So if you have a vaccine, you could either target something that is a self antigen like PSA, something that is normally found on the, on the, tar on the um, uh, target of interest, um, or you could find something that would only be on the tumor, like a neoantigen, a neoepitope. Um, um, if you're going for adoptive cellular therapy, you can also have self-antigen or neoantigen, but to make these, these require ex vivo manipulation of the of the T cells, and so by definition, they are gonna be more complex. These don't require a hot tumor, so that's, that's why I think these are gonna be important avenues going forward, especially in combination approaches for these cold tumors. The Problem with self antigens is that they're relatively weak in terms of uh, an immune response, uh, whereas the new antigens potentially are quite strong, and it depends on the target for the adoptive cellular therapy, often you're just taking a very defined small target rather than the entire uh, gene. Uh, um, and so you may or may not be able to get an appropriate target uh, for the uh, immune system. But one of the things that I think is important is really, um, can we generate a, an immune response, a, a um, a high avidity immune response if we go with this more simple route and even if we have a, start off with a relatively weak antigen. So I'm going to walk you through that real quickly here. So if we start off with a uh, off-the-shelf based approach with a vaccine targeting PSA, which is found on normal prostate as well as prostate cancer cells, what you can see is something like this. If you can kill that cell with a, with a T cell, as that cell is, is dying, it can be taken up by antigen presenting cells. These are cells that are part of the immune system that really can uh, present antigens to the T cells and can teach the T cells which targets to look for. And they can come back to the draining lymph nodes and in that lymph node, they can then interact with those T cells they can now not only present um, the target, the initial target, which was PSA, which is found in the tumor, but they can present any target that's immunologically relevant in that patient. So now, instead of just having an immune response against PSA, you can now start to have an immune response against other tissue-specific antigens, or perhaps these neoepitopes, these targets that are found only in the tumor, and maybe stronger antigens, more immunologically relevant for the patient. And this newly charged immune response can then come back to the tumor, attack the tumor, and lead to this further killing of the uh, tumor cells. And this is not just a one-time
time process, but this is an ongoing process where over time it can become more and more clinically relevant in that given patient. And if you have then this process that over time is kind of like an auger, if you will, you could start out with an immune response against this self-antigen, let's say PSA here, but over time it could become broader uh, with this antigen cascade, as Dr. Hodge mentioned, or antigen spreading, and perhaps even end up that the majority of the cells, as, as you saw from the mice, are not specific for the vaccine, but they're actually specific for a very immunogenic protein that's found in that specific patient without having to go and figure out uh, in the laboratory what that is. The immune system can do that itself. So let me just walk you through what is currently uh, available for patients with prostate cancer. There is one uh, approved therapeutic vaccine for patients with prostate cancer, and that's the T or Provenge. And this is a vaccine that um, was shown to improve survival by uh, about um, 4.1 months, a 22% a, um, reduction in the risk of death. And we recently, uh, about a, a year ago, um, published a guidelines for the use of immunotherapy with prostate cancer. Basically, what we said was don't expect the the PSA to go down substantially in these patients or to see objective responses, shrinking of tumors, but we do see, we do see, expect to see longer survival. And so we want, we suggested the use in earlier uh, disease, earlier in the disease setting before patients have symptomatic disease. This is a uh, vaccine um, called PROSVAC that was developed at the National Cancer Institute in collaboration with Bavarian Nordic. And this is a vaccine targeting PSA that has multiple T cell co-stimulatory molecules, a pox viral based vaccine, where you can put these genes into pox viral vectors and uh, inject these uh, under the skin. So this is a, an off the shelf based approach where you basically only have to take this vial out of the freezer and inject it into patients. So actually pretty uh, straightforward, pretty easy logistically to use. And what we found was that you could get really uh, good immune responses with this. You could, first of all, it was very safe to give uh, in patients with advanced cancer, but also you could get nice immune responses. I just want to highlight a couple of things, and that is that um, a little over half of the patients mattered a, an immune response with this vaccine that we could measure easily. Um, and uh, the uh, number of T cells specific for PSA was about the same uh, as the number of T cells specific for the influenza vaccine uh, in these patients, suggesting that this was a robust immune response. And, and two thirds of these patients that were tested were able to have this antigen spreading or this, the um, formation of immune response to targets not found in the vaccine, suggesting that there was immune mediated killing going on. Unfortunately, however, the, uh, there was a large ra randomized phase three study of this vaccine, and it did not show an improvement in survival. Um, and we await the full data set, which will be coming out or is planned to come out in, uh, in June for this. So what do we think may have happened here? So we know that we initiated immune responses. We could see the uh, activation of the T cells in the blood. But maybe those T cells, once they got to the tumor, couldn't overcome the negative tumor microenvironment there. So really couldn't overcome this. Uh, um. And so what, we wanted to, what I wanted to show you next was what happens when the T cell gets into the tumor. So here's a T cell shown here in green and a tumor cell uh, in light uh, pink here. And what happens is that if a T cell comes in, it recognizes the tumor cell it will start to make these immune mediators and, and, and release them to kind of bring in other immune cells. But these immune mediators can have a direct effects on the tumor cell too. It, um, some of these immune mediators include things like gamma interferon, and this will cause upregulation of PDL1 on the surface of the tumor cell. Now, what PDL1 is, is the, it's a big old stop sign for the T cells. The T cell binds to that with this PD-1 here, and it will kind of just shut down that T cell. So now, all of a sudden, that T cell that is, can recognize the tumor is just completely shut down, and it cannot work. 
However, if you come in with an antibody against either PD-1 or PDL one you can break this signal from happening and you can allow this T cell to be reinvigorated and, uh, and go ahead and, and wipe out the, the tumor cell. So in order to look at this, we did a clinical trial um, where we uh, are combining vaccine with immune checkpoint inhibition. Now, um, this vaccine is PROSVAC, the same vaccine that I, I mentioned already. Um, and we're combining it with ipilimumab and nivolumab. I'm only just going to say one thing about ipilimumab because we actually stopped the, the addition of the ipilimumab in that study. Um, it is another immune checkpoint inhibitor. It is associated with a little bit more toxicity than, than the anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL1 agents. Um, but the idea behind this study is we want to be able to uh, do a, a group of patients that have metastatic prostate cancer, and then we want to get into the patients who still have intact prostates, give, this, give these drugs together, and then we can look at what's going on in the tumor microenvironment. As Dr. Hodges mentioned, this is really key to understand what the impact of the uh, therapy is on the tumor. Well, this is the trial design. We give the vaccine and the checkpoint inhibitors, and then uh, we give, take the patient's um, prostate out. At week nine here, we have the initial biopsy, and we can compare the tissue specimens, the biopsy, to the radical prostatectomy specimen. And we're looking at immune infiltrate um, as the primary analysis on the study, and looking really pretty in-depth at multiple correlative studies within the tumor microenvironment. I want to just share with you some very preliminary data on these patients treated in this metastatic group. Um, and um, I, I do want to mention that we did take out the ipilimumab, so we're now only going to be doing two of these cohorts um, because of, of side effects that we saw with the addition of the ipilimumab. So before I, I show you the, the preliminary data, I just want to mention with uh, vaccine alone, you wouldn't expect to see decreases in PSA. And with immune checkpoint inhibitor alone, you would not expect to see decreases in PSA. So what I'm showing you here is the combination um, of vaccine with checkpoint inhibitor. Now, I mentioned the first two patients did also have ipilimumab, which can have some PSA activity. Uh, but then uh, patients three and four only had vaccine and nivolumab. And so that's the anti-PD-1 antibody. And what you can see here is that two of these four patients had very nice decreases in their PSA, which remained uh, down for quite a long period of time, and in fact, um, are both uh, still on study here. Um, so this is very early data. We hope to continue this study and get additional patients if we can confirm that we're seeing more of these types of responses, I think we're going to look at this in patients with metastatic disease um, as, a, as a dual uh, combination study. Unfortunately, though, there are multiple different things in the tumor microenvironment that can shut down an immune response. It's not just PD-1 or PDL one So we focused so far on, on PD-1 and PDL one the, the impact of PDL one in the tumor microenvironment. But there are other things like IDO, you already heard about from Dr. Hodge, this, uh, this thing that can kind of starve the T cells, um, or TGF beta, which also can decrease an immune response. So the question is, could we add agents that target these entities also? So I'm going to just mention briefly um, the rationale for a clinical trial that is uh, going to be opening next month. We got the may proceed letter from the FDA uh, a week and a half ago. And it's a, a vaccine plus um, IL-15 for an expansion of the, of the NK cells and T cells, uh, as well as at, uh, attacking what's going on in the tumor microenvironment, PDL one TGF-beta, and IDO. So in the last brief story here, I'll just uh, share with you the rationale. There's, there's no data slides, really, um, except for preclinical data. So first of all, the target of the vaccine. This is a very interesting target. You already heard Dr. Hodge mention this, this brachyuria. It's this transcription factor that's involved in um, embryogenesis and um, involved in this metastatic process. So it really helps tumor cells spread. 
And if you can uh, shut it down, tumor cells don't spread nearly as well. It's also involved in resistance to therapy, whether it's radiation therapy, chemotherapy, or even immunotherapy. Um, and it's, this particular uh, target is overexpressed in prostate cancer, and uh, it is correlated with more aggressive uh, prostate cancer. So I think it's you know, a, a very good target, a very biologically relevant target for many different cancers, including prostate cancer. We recently published um, a study in November uh, of a vaccine targeting this agent, uh, this target rather. Um, and this um, uh, was very well tolerated and 82% of the patients uh, were able to develop a T cell response to uh, brachiuri. The next agent I want to mention is a, a, a novel first-in-human agent that we presented at the American Society of Clinical Oncology meetings last year um, of, uh, that both targets PDL1, which we've already talked about, as well as TGF-beta. So it, it sequesters or vacuums up all the TGF-beta in the tumor microenvironment. And TGF-beta is, is important because it um, is involved in tumor angiogenesis. As when mentioned at the beginning, angiogenesis is one of the uh, things that helps tumors grow. It uh, is also involved in suppression of the immune response. It's also involved in this metastatic process, this EMT that we talked about, and also fibrosis, which can uh, lead to impaired access of drugs and uh, um, immune cells into the tumor microenvironment. So if we can block all this, maybe that would be a good thing. In this uh, first in human phase one study, we did see some uh, evidence of, of clinical activity also as a single agent. So what we're doing in this study is we're combining um, the vaccine with this M7824, this anti pdl one TGF-beta, and then we're adding in uh, IL-15, which could lead to better uh, um, T cells and more effective T cells, as well as NK cells. And then we're adding in this IDO inhibitor in three sequential cohorts. And if we see a signal um, in patients, meaning a drop in PSA that's sustained or a, a, a decrease in tumor volume that's sustained, then we will um, take those cohorts where we're seeing that signal and we'll uh, randomize between those cohorts. So, just to kind of put this in perspective, what, what th different things are going to um, <clears throat> impact. So this is the vaccine. It's going to impact on the T cells, creating brachiuri-specific T cells. The M7824, it's going to take all this bad TGF-beta that's made by tumor cells or myeloid-derived suppressor cells in the tumor microenvironment and block this immune suppression, as well as block the PDL1 one um, and allowing the T cells to work better. And then we're going to add in this IL-15, which will increase the number and activity of T cells and NK cells. And finally, we're going to add in the epicatastat, the IDO inhibitor, that will um, decrease the function of regulatory cells and increase the function of, of, um, of the effector T cells. So in conclusion, uh, T cell Poor tumors may require a spark to get the immune system to recognize and, and seek to destroy the tumor. And we believe that one of the most efficient ways of doing this is with vaccine. And Cepula cell T is the first uh, therapeutic vaccine to be approved by the FDA and, and is approved for prostate cancer. And there are some tumors, uh, prostate cancer tumors, that may respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors alone, but this is a relatively small subset, MSI high uh, cancers. The tumor immunity cycle, as we showed you, is a really an ongoing iterative process where the immune system can select for the best targets that may be more uh, immunologically relevant. And I believe, strongly believe, that approaches that both steer the immune system with a vaccine as well as allow those uh, immune cells to work effectively at the level of the tumor are going to be the best options going forward in combination uh, therapy studies, and there are ongoing studies that are going to examine the utility of this approach. Now, we do have uh, um, a patient that is here with us, and um, 
what I'd like to do now, and this is a patient actually that um, is on the one of the the studies that that I mentioned with the um, the anti uh, PD one and the vaccine, and so I'd like to uh, introduce uh, him, and uh, then we'll we'll talk a little bit. So maybe we can have a seat up here. Can we get the mic? Afterwards, we'd have more time for, for questions. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Am I good? Yeah. Perfect. So, Tom, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, about your professional life, and then, uh, and then we'll talk about your cancer after that. Okay. I was a general surgeon uh, in the Army for 30 years. Um, and this immunology stuff is absolutely fascinating because I was saying earlier that when I was in medical school, I think we only knew that there was humoral and cellular immunity, and I'm not sure if we had T and B cells, but she says we did. So I, you know, <laughs> I claim that a surgeon forgets these things too easily. Um, in 2004, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Standard garden variety, Gleason 3 plus 3, low volume on the uh, cores. I had a radical prostatectomy. I'm a surgeon. You know, I'm going to have a prostatectomy. Um, when we came out of the operating room and got the final path back, it was a Gleason 3 plus 5 um, and had uh, a positive margin. So just for those of you, a Gleason score is basically how aggressive the tumor looks under the microscope, and this is bad. This is a, this is a bad-looking tumor. Yeah, the, the 5 was what scared me most, and I actually had a friend who was an oncologist, and we put together a chemotherapy regimen that was based on a clinical trial that was being done back then, but we used docetaxel. Um, and androgen deprivation for two years. And uh, with that, with the androgen deprivation, PSA went away um, very nicely. And then after we came off the trial and the testosterone came back, the PSA came back, but then the PSA kept going. So we worked it up again and uh, didn't find any evidence of extra pelvic disease. There may have been some stuff lighting up in the pelvis. The radiation guys wanted to radiate me at first, but I was more concerned about the uh, potential metastatic disease. So we radiated, and beautiful decay curve with the thing coming down and asymptotically approaching zero and stayed undetectable for four and a half years, and then it came back. Um, it's, it is the aggressive tumor that has come back. Um, and what I've gotten is a local recurrence, and then also now I have bony mets. I have four mets. Um, we did Provenge um, once we had the diagnosis of metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. Um, I've had enzalutamide. Um, it started with androgen deprivation therapy, and that worked for maybe a month or two. Provenge isn't supposed to show me anything in the PSA. Um, the uh, enzalutamide brought things down nicely for two months, and then it just went right back up. Um, you look at doubling times for prostate cancer, and my doubling times typically run between one and two months. So that's a very, very aggressive prostate cancer. Most prostate cancers just are sort of indolent. Most of them are cured with their primary therapy. I'm the rarity to have one of these guys that really just wants to go crazy. Um, I guess it was back in June, May, June time frame where we were picking up some more bony mets and I looked at two studies over, at, over here and I chose to be on the one that is right up there. <laughs> and I think I'm number, I'm patient four, yep. if I'm right. Um, so, so let me, so first, um, how, long, how long have we been <laughs> How long have you been coming to see me? I've been seeing you, Dr. Gully, for, since 2005. Yeah. So we go back a long way. Um, my wife and I immediately latched on to him. He, he has a, a very compassionate bedside manner. Um, and, of course, you know, you guys are all brilliant, but sometimes that doesn't translate into being able to talk with, with patients. I mean, I'm, I'm a surgeon, so I don't understand any of this stuff. My wife was a nurse. Well, you know, we've got some medical stuff, but nothing like you guys are doing. So we latched onto him, and we're not going to let him go. 
And, and so tell me what you were feeling, what you were going through before you started on this study. Where were you physically? Sure. Um, as you could see, well, yeah, I guess you can see there. The PSA went from 20-something up to 55 over five weeks-ish. And about that, I'm actually, I would started a downward course probably back in November of last year. And by the time July came around, I was really not doing well at all. I was tight, we, in clinical medicine, we talk tight, tightening of the spiral. You know, I was really starting to circle the drain very quickly. And I think I was, I mean, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I don't think that I would be here now if this hadn't happened the way it did. Um, I was seeing weekly changes for the worse, um, losing weight, no appetite, no energy, no stamina. Um, the tumors were growing, um, and we started with the uh, with the Prostvac, and actually I couldn't get the Nevo quickly because I had an obstructed ureter because of the local recurrence. So we had to get the kidneys fixed a little bit first before they could give me the Nevo. So I was about three weeks late getting the Nevo. Within two weeks of the first um, infusion of Nevo, um, I started feeling better. It was weird. I, I had more energy, and it was like, hmm, I don't know what's going on. Went in for the PSA a week later, and it had dropped by 80%. And I said, hmm, that makes some sense now. I don't know why I'm feeling better. Um, it, it continued to have incremental drops, um, about 80% for several of them. And um, the tumor, actually, on the studies, the repeat staging, tumor has been getting smaller. The bone mets, even though they're still there, again, the surgeon looks at them and says, they're not as bright as they used to be. Um, so I think that's good. And the most telling thing was that um, because of the local recurrence, I had to have transurethral resections of the cancer at the bladder neck. Every time we did the pathology on it, it was a Gleason 5 plus 5. They look at the two most prominent patterns, and both of my prominent patterns were 5, the worst that you could be. Dr. Gully thought it would be interesting to get some fresh tumor. So on one of these um, turcaps, I call them, they went ahead and biopsied the areas that had been previously just incredibly rich with tumor and a very aggressive tumor. They could not find any tumor whatsoever in those biopsies, special stains, everything. They saw necrotic stuff, they saw all kinds of stuff going on, but no cancer, no, a lot, no live cancer. I mean, I really look at this as it's given me five to six months of fantastic life, taking what had been a really not, not doing well at all, to now being able to play with my grandkids on the floor, um, do things that I want to do uh, uh, in in take, helping other people with patient, patients with cancer or particularly prostate cancers. And it's just been absolutely incredible. Now the PSA is coming back up. But again, we're not looking at the PSA primarily. We're looking at how I'm doing. And I think that's one of the things that I had to learn is, you know, the PSA, one of the docs calls it patient scaring antigen. And <laughs> it is because you watch this daggone thing and it goes places that you don't really wanted to go. But um, I get restaged again in March, and I'm hoping that we're going to still have excellent news as far as what the tumors are doing. And at the very least, we're, we're kicking. We're doing well. And one of the other docs says, you know, all you want to do is just keep, keep kicking the can a little bit farther down the road because something is coming along in the pipeline. And there's a lot of stuff that you bright folks are looking at, and I just, I just hope we can, I can stick around long enough to get the benefit of some of them. Thank you so much, Tom. I, I understand that many of you may have questions out there for either myself or Dr. Beam here. I uh, would be happy to answer questions. I'm a little curious why the reaction of Python first increase land drop so deeply, so every patient, how, uh, how uh, I mean, how much patients have these reaction patterns? So their outcome will be long-lived 
So, great question. Uh, I would say that, um, first of all, immunotherapy can take a little while to, to kick in. And with these immune checkpoint inhibitors, you, you can see that some patients go up before they come down. But I would also uh, remind you that the combination approach here didn't start until when you see that, uh, that peak. And, and so, so the, the initial, um, f initial few measurements are without the, the addition of the nivolumab because he had to start the nivolumab late. So you see that peak right there? Yeah, that's where he started the nivolumab. So that's where you get the true combination. Yes, blue started at the second dot. So I have a um, um, follow-up question. That goes back to BCG vaccine and bladder cancer. So in bladder cancer, we have um, almost all patients that uh, were studied with any of the inhibitors or PDL inhibitors, all of them got BCG vaccine at some point, probably as a first course of therapy. And perhaps the response in bladder cancer that we see better than that some of the others is because those patients have some enhanced immunity already in the past. And perhaps this example of timing of having this dramatic response because of surgical complications that you had and the therapy was delayed, teaching us something. I don't know, but perhaps it's a way to look at immunotherapy prolonging the vaccine cycle before you start with the inhibitor? So I think that from all of our preclinical studies that we've done, I, th I think you're right. I think you want to get an immune response on board first and then come in with the with a combination if you can. Um, I think that Dr. Hodge would, man it would show you, you that every time we do that, you get, that's when you see really good responses. Um, I think there could be an issue with, with timing if you do it too far in advance. If you don't have a good enough immune response, if you've kind of petered out and you've stopped the immune response and then you come in with the immune checkpoint inhibition, it's going to be too late. Have you had any experience with repeating the nivolumumab or the ipilimumab in a patient? Yeah, so we've, uh, what we do with these patients is we continue the vaccine and the nivolumab, but in patients that we've had to stop the immune checkpoint inhibitor because they haven't, um, because they've had side effects from it, what we've seen is often those patients will respond again when, uh, upon reinitiation of therapy. So maybe I'm missing something. Maybe uh, you can go over certain things again. Um, but in general, like, uh, it, it's a great idea that uh, there is a cycle of immune system attacking antigens mm -hmm. uh, that being expressed. But on the other hand, if you think about it, those antigens, they were or will be present in our bodies at some point in some organ and some tissue and our kind of innate immune uh, system should have learned like not to attack those antigens. So why would it, the tumor will be attacked with them, you know? Um, yes. Although I understand if you add something else to suppress, it will help, but maybe if you could go yes. over more. So I think there's two things here. There's, there are targets that are tissue specific that may be present and they're self antigens. And then there are targets that are neoepitopes. These are mutations that are found only in the tumor that are, the immune system hasn't seen before and that are more immunogenic. So those are the things that we think often what are what the immune response drifts to or cascades to, if you will, and says, okay, this is the most immunogenic for this given patient. Those immune responses, for what's ever, whatever reason, the immune system hasn't uh, really focused on them up until that point. I would argue that 
in the vast majority of cases, the immune system does focus on them and wipes out the tumor, and we never even hear about the tumor. And it's those cases that somehow the immune system messes up and doesn't, uh, doesn't find them, that that's what leads to this um, clinically relevant tumor. And this is just an opportunity to get this uh, immune system to recognize it. And, and why did, would it recognize it now but not recognize it you know, without the, the vaccine? Well, I think if you can initiate that immune-mediated killing and you kill that cell in an immunologically relevant manner, and then it can take this, th these targets back to the, to the lymph node and in an in a area that is primed to recognize the, lymph, the, the targets and primed to get the immune system going, I think it's much better than trying to do that in the tumor microenvironment where there's so many negative regulatory influences. So I think it's just lowering the bar, lowering the threshold to get a clinically relevant immune response going. And I think it's entirely dependent on um, having a tumor microenvironment that, that is, uh, allows the effector cells to kill in an immunologically relevant manner. So I, I have a question. I actually, I think, Dr. Hode, you mentioned it, or maybe you did. Um, so my question is, whether uh, the mouse models in which human tumors are, are put, do they maintain this, what you called uh, T cell rare population? Uh, that is uh, the, uh, the frozen tundra versus the, the hot tropics. Is that the same in the animal model as it is in the human disease in terms of T cell permeation of the primary tumor? So I, I would say that there are syngenaic models, in other words, m mouse models that have mouse tumors that, that some of them are pretty bland in terms of T cell response and, and others are, uh, are more immunogenic. Um, if you take human tumors and put it into mice, usually those are in mice that don't have good immune systems. Otherwise, they'll just completely wipe out the t human tumor. But there have been you know, ways of humanizing the, the mouse immune system. And so, the, um, but yes, we can model T cell poor tumors in mice and T cell inflamed tumors in mice. Um, I have a question about the um, measuring treatment response, particularly by imaging. Yes. Right now, at the time that we are thinking about the tumor, um, and in addition, the, the tundra versus um, moving toward the tropical island, whatever we measure as a tumor, either by structural imaging or functional metabolic imaging, FDG, is just a combination of both. So at the time that we want to measure the efficacy of whatever we measure, if we go with the old paradigms of just like measuring the size by structural imaging or even the function by FDG uh, glycolysis, uh, which is combination of both the tumor and microenvironment, and we are just actively modifying both, uh, it may just like no change while uh, dramatically there is a change in reality. So what is the approach at this moment uh, to monitor uh, treatment response? Great question. Uh, you know, I think that there are multiple things that we're doing to try and understand the, the biology of these and, and what the impact that our immunotherapies have. Right now for determining whether something is uh, responding or not responding. Most of the patients actually with just structural imaging, we can tell if the tumor is shrinking uh, or not. With the one caveat that occasionally we will see what is called pseudoprogression, where the tumor actually gets bigger because potentially of a massive influx of T cells before it gets smaller. Typically in those patients, however, they will feel like much better and, um, and there, there's other things that we can do. So what we do is in patients treated with immunotherapy, we typically, if they have their first restaging, they're feeling good, but their size of their lesion is much bigger, we continue on until we get another restaging. 
Usually by that time, if that was a, a pseudo progression, we'll see that tumor is much smaller by then as the T cells wipe out the tumor. Um, if they are not doing well clinically, um, that's typically um, because it's actual progression, not pseudo progression. However, getting back to your uh, question about uh, functional imaging, we are doing functional imaging. We're starting to do functional imaging, what we call immunopet. So in FDG PET is, is uh, something that can be useful in, in some indications, but we're actually starting to look at uh, either imaging the T cells or imaging PDL1, which is a, kind of the footprint of an activated T cell, and see what is changing over time and where this PDL1 expression or this T cell uh, expression is. And this can be quite useful in seeing, okay, if the tumor is larger, is it cold? Or is it hot? Is, it, is there a lot of T cells there? Or is there a lot of PDL1 expression indicating a lot of T cells that are making gamma interferon? And that, I think, can be helpful for both helping us understand the function as well as understand whether the patient is, is progressing or not. So stay tuned. Um, there are clinical trials ongoing using those now. It's too early to use them in routine clinical practice, though. Okay. Oh, we have one more. Go ahead. <laughs> Moving forward, um, based on the trial that he was on, um, how will that affect the trials that he can be selected for and also select here at the uh, NIH? Really good question, a very important question, and, we, and something that we um, always talk to our patients about. If you go on this study, what is that going to cross off the list for you for future studies? So it's possible it would cross off the list uh, and other immune checkpoint inhibitor studies if that was in the eligibility criteria. We typically, if, if he had, if Tom had significant adverse events to um, a PD-1 inhibitor, the nivolumab in this case, if he had some really bad uh, autoimmune phenomenon, then we would say, yeah, we probably don't want to try that with another immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, otherwise, it really wouldn't impact uh, his ability to go on any of our other currently uh, open studies. I have one okay, more well, question. Uh, one more uh, question. You mentioned that the response to the um, uh, one of the vaccines was similar to the flu vaccine because they had a five-fold increase. Now, we know with the flu vaccine, elderly individuals have a less take than the younger individual. Do you think you're seeing anything similar in your studies or don't have enough patients or how is it standard? So this is a really good question. I can tell you um, that we've looked at response rates um, across large studies and, and uh, meta-analyses um, and looked at the median age above and below the median age and looked at the <laughs> objective response rates and looked at the, uh, at the forest plot to see, okay, which, you know, does it matter if you're younger versus older? And I can tell you there doesn't appear to be a difference right now, which is very interesting and, and reassuring. I just point out that Jimmy Carter, as you all know, had melanoma metastatic to his brain, was treated with an immune checkpoint inhibitor, and is, for all intents and purposes, from what we can see, um, cured of his cancer. And he's no spring chicken. And so I, I think it, it that to me suggests that even people that are older can mount uh, responses to this. I would further say that in studies that have compared head-to-head, -head, randomized studies comparing immune checkpoint inhibitor, PD-1 or PDL one versus chemotherapy, patients uh, get many fewer side effects with the immune checkpoint inhibitor than they get with chemotherapy. So if you're dealing with somebody that may be can't tolerate things as well, maybe immune checkpoint inhibitor as a, you know, with a PD-1 or PD-L1 anyway, maybe not the anti-CTLA-4 like ipilimumab, but um, maybe they'll respond and tolerate it better. And, and I guess uh, okay. the question for you is, is how do you respond to chemo um, and antibiotics? Yeah, um, the chemotherapy was as expected, you know, I, I was fatigued and lost my hair and did all the, the things that you would think, um, but no major complications. Um, so far, um, on this study, 
the, the worst I get is a local reaction to the site of injection of the Prostvac, a little bit of erythema, induration, pain. Um, as, far as, as far as I can tell, I've had no immune-mediated adverse events whatsoever. And I mean, this has been like, as far as the treatment goes, it's a walk in the park. All right, well, <clears throat> I want to thank uh, the three doctors who were with us this afternoon, Dr. Gully, Dr. Hogg, for their presentations, and Dr. Bob, we greatly appreciate your willingness to share your experience with us. It's very important. I think this is an excellent example of the sort of bridge building and uh, the, the need for uh, continued basic research and understanding host immune systems and development of targets and so forth, and their translation into uh, patients with uh, very serious diseases. So next week, we will be back in uh, Building 50, and the topic is uh, inflammation and uh, coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease, another important, challenging, bridge-building problem. So thank you all very much. Thank you.